Welcome to another edition of the Delaware Valley Original Music Showcase. Tonight we continue our mission of helping to support original music in the Delaware Valley with our three-step process. Listen, experience, and pass on original music in the Delaware Valley. But we need your help to get the word out. So let's get started. Tonight's artist is from Delaware. Her classical training has led her through her career, but her original music is her heart and soul. Let's meet Lori here on the Delaware Valley Original Music Showcase. difficult times it's nice to know there are places that are trying to bring you some normalcy and still look out for your health the blue crab grill is one of those places and you can enjoy a social distance dining experience or just get curbside pickup all you have to do is call 302-737-1100 for a reservation or to place an order or bluecrabgrill.com and make your reservation and remember we're all in this together so now you got a taste of her music, let's find out more about her in the interview. business and uh, he would sell off furniture that was in the basement and we weren't allowed to go down there when the furniture was there um, and this 
one particular time, there was a piano. Somebody wanted to get rid of the piano and they weren't going to take it when they moved. So he was going to sell that off and it was in the basement. And somehow I must have heard that, um, you know, there was a piano down there. I think they must have let it drop. And uh, so I started sneaking down there to play the piano. And we were like, if I got caught, <laughs> I was going to get in big trouble. So my dad one day came home and I was down there playing it. And I thought I was going to get a spanking. And instead he said, Lori, do you want that piano? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so I was so excited. And I still have that piano to this day. I've actually rebuilt it. it. has tuning dates. The original tuning date that I have is 1901. It's an upright grand um, Cable Nelson, which was eventually sold to Baldwin. So that's how I got involved. And I started playing piano, taking lessons then. Um, my first teacher was on the road a lot the first year. So, but when I was in sick, uh, sex, I, I ended up with another teacher named Mrs. Dan Penny that was down on Harmony Road in uh, in, in Newark, and uh, I had her, you know, straight from middle school. So. wrote I was 10 um, and I was in school and my course teacher had, um, wanted us to write something it was an assignment and I ended up writing a whole little um, sonantina I called it sonantina NG and she wanted to have it published but my parents wouldn't let her because of copyrights or royalties and all kind of stuff like they were just a, you know leery about the whole thing so um, that's when I started writing and then when I was in middle school um, I really wrote songs instead of like writing in a diary. I would just go to the piano all the time and you know that's that just became the thing that I did and I didn't know other people wrote songs. In fact I was when I was little I only thought it, you had to be like dead before they played your songs on the radio because I only heard like classic music or uh, classic classical music um, like Beethoven or I heard um, you know old you know people like Perry Como and Tony Bennett and things like that that my dad and mom would listen to so I wasn't even really aware of um, rock music until I was at about middle school um, so and I wasn't allowed to play any any contemporary music I remember I was in sixth grade and I got to hear um, uh, both sides now by um, well it was Judy oh gosh, I was like What's her name? Judy Collins had recorded it, and also um, "Love Is Blue," which was a piano solo that was really popular on the radio. And I had heard them, and, and they must have been popular on my dad's station. I don't know, but I wanted those songs, so I was allowed to have that music. That was the first music that wasn't um, piano, classical piano that I was allowed to play, or church hymns. We had, I played um, in fifth grade. I was playing on the regular rotation at Red Lion Methodist Church down the street. So I was like, you know, in fifth grade playing for all the old ladies. When I got to middle school, I wanted to play so much. Um, I, I wanted to be able to sing and I always ended up playing for everybody. So I remember in my in middle school, I did not tell my chorus teacher that I could play the piano because I knew I would be playing the piano for the chorus. So I waited until the last day of middle school when I was working on high school and sat, sat down the piano and played. And he immediately got on the phone and said, what high school are you going to? I called my high school and said, you have an accompanist coming. So my whole freshman year, I played for all the choruses and I never got to sing um, in chorus when I got to high school. And then my sophomore year, they had all state chorus and I scored so high in the state when I auditioned for her. Like they always want to send people just to get, you know, to say we got like oh, 30 people in the all state. So I went and I scored so high. And my music teacher was like, like I didn't know you could sing. I was like, that's because you only had to play the piano. It's very singer songwriter pop. I'm very pop, more like cerebralist type of music. Um, the things that I write 
um, or like Sarah McLaughlin, um, uh, Amy Mann um, in the folk things, but I would definitely say I have that kind of feel. And I had, you know, over the years, like that was my initial experience was classical, and then I moved into musical theater. Um, and then I, um, in my early 20s, I moved into playing rock and singer songwriter stuff out on the circuit. I was in a band called Last Metro, which was all like talking heads kind of thing, and we were all original. And then I went into The Stand, which was all like um, Americana Bodines. We opened for the Bodines and um, T-Bone Burnett and things like that. And when I played with them, and on both of those bands, I was like, um, you know, just a player. Not the, I was a writer for Last Metro, but not for The Stand. I didn't do any of the writing. Um, so that kind of changed over my experience when I played in those other bands. I initially remember when I was in Last Metro, I, I liked it went to New York City and I studied MIDI synthesis. I went off to um, school because I felt like I didn't know anything about keyboards and elect electronics and computers and stuff like that. So I um, left my day job and went up to school in New York so just so I could be better at that. Um, and then I uh, you know, learned how to hook everything up with the computer. So I think it was kind of early and cutting edge when I did that. I mean, it was during the Talking Heads 80s phase, the end of, end of the 80s for me. Um, and then the stand was in the beginning of the 90s. So that's when I, I went into, and, that, and I've always played in original names. I haven't played in like, um, you know, cover bands or anything like that. And I mean, I can play covers, but I prefer originals and being able to bring my own thing there. And since then I've done a lot of solo stuff. But initially I was really too shy to just be a solo artist. One of my first ones is called Red Shoes, it's an EP, which you obviously know is a Dorothy theme. So one of the songs I was getting ready to play for you is called Black Dress, which a lot of people and a lot of my fans like. It was from, it's, I heard this so long ago, it's like a girl on MySpace friended me and she had this weird picture where she was putting her hands through something and you could see her hands going through but you didn't know where they were going and it looked like she was putting out windows. So when I clicked on, it was a black and white picture, when I clicked on the picture to see what she was doing, it was a, a full length. And she was in a phone booth, a, a British phone booth, so it was candy apple red, and she had shoes on like this. And she had a tight black dress. And I went, oh gosh, when I lose 15 pounds, I am gonna get a tight black dress like that and some shoes like that, and I'm going to wear it. <laughs> but then right instead I went right down to the piano and I wrote a song about doing that and all the things that you wait to, um, you know, like, don't put off your life. Um, don't save it for later, do it now. And that's what that song is about, Black Dress. I'm gonna put on my black dress and I'm gonna do it now. So um, I did get the, these are my shoes and this is my piano. And I did get the shoes, but they are uncomfortable. So I do not wear them. <laughs> so that was, a, um, what maybe with that, with that CD, the things that are on here are, Okay, so there was Black Dress with the red shoes, um, but then I also have a song called Dorothy, which is about, like, Dorothy was, I've done The Wizard of Oz, like, four or five times. I've done The Wiz, I've done two different versions of The w Wizard of Oz, played them, so um, one time while I was doing one of The Wizard of Oz versions, I wrote the song called Dorothy, which is Don't Call Me Dorothy, Just Call Me Dot, and it has, like, some little vignettes of that on there. So everything on this CD has a little bit to do with, uh, it's, um, okay, Shoe. There's a song that I wrote called Shoe, um, but it's not, it's like a shoe, shoe, be doo be doo shoe, be doo be doo And then there's Dorothy, and then there's Black Dress. So they all kind of, they, they are not, they're, they're not like a sequel or anything. They don't go, go together, but they do go together. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're like, they're like a family. <laughs> and then um, let's make it last, which was during that same period of time, and a song called Camera. And then I had it as a bonus, Small Town USA, because I got asked to write a song for a reality, a possible reality show, and then it all fell through. So that's on there, and that's a little bit Bruce Springsteen-y kind of. 
So, I mean, so that was just a bonus that people have. When I did Pandora's box, I had like my first six, and then I had my next six in case we got past that. But I was using like Sheila Hershey on cello. So um, the one that's on on there on Pandora's box is at, um, Amsterdam, and that does have a full blown strings, um, cello and violin and everything I'll put in that song um, on the CD. So I think if you if you want to be an original artist or if you are an artist or musician that you just have to do it and you have to keep doing it and you have to do it regardless of what happens like regardless of outside circumstances you know whether it's covid or whether it's the economy or or whatever you just put you just you're an artist so you just keep doing it and you may never, like a lot of people nowadays, because we have this whole reality-based, you know, um, capitalist society now, that's not what we used to have with artists. You know, Beethoven, they didn't have TV. People, people, people are, people lose so much of their um, life and time and creative juices, wasting it, <laughs> doing a, you know, on, on fluff, like they keep us like locked in like the matrix. Um, but as an artist, I, I would never discourage a person from doing it. I would say, don't think you're going to be famous. Don't, you, you're not doing it to be famous. You know, too many people do it for the wrong reason. If you're an artist, it's who you are. It's in your core. So you just keep doing it no matter what. And I find myself now, like I've been really studying, and I hadn't done this before, but like, what other composers and artists have done. Like I've gone to other countries and when I go there, I go to a lot of museums and stuff. Like I went to uh, Norway and I went to see like um, Edward Grieg's home or Edward Munch, um, Ed, um, Henrik Ibsen's home. And um, I went to see Vigeland Park, which is like this sculpture. And the massive amount of work these people have done in their lifetime, even like when you read about Beethoven, is you just kind of go, wow i am really skimming the bottom of the barrel i'm just not doing enough if i when i when i die what i what legacy i leave behind you know and i really think that that's probably more the impetus as an artist you should be thinking more about how do i explore everything how do i keep my interest going and it does ebb and flow there are times that i want to do it more than others there are times that i always say i'm going to quit um but at the core of who i am it's what I'll do now. I will not rescue you. I cannot leave you. During these difficult times, it's nice to know there are places that are trying to bring you some normalcy and still look out for your health. The Blue Crab Grill is one of those places, and you can enjoy a social distance dining experience or just get curbside pickup. All you have to do is call 302-737-1100 for a reservation or to place an order or bluecrabgrill.com and make your reservation. And remember, we're all in this together. I really feel so grateful to Paula and to George for what they've done here. You know, you're allowed to do this again. <laughs> Did I find somebody to go along? We have got so many good musicians, and I am just so honored to be up here among the nominees with 
all the ones that are here. I mean, they are just so great. The Watson Brothers, the Hurricanes, just everybody. I can't believe what a wonderful thing this is. Now it's time for more music from Lori here on the Delaware Valley Original Music Showcase.